Good morning, everyone. Uh, so you've just heard about air pollution. Uh, we probably all in the room uh, appreciate that air pollution is really uh, one of the main drivers of poor health in many parts of the world. WHO figures recommend that uh, there's around 7 million premature deaths every year associated with, with the air pollution which people are breathing. So it's, it's a big issue. It's, it's one of the number one environmental issues that we have to deal with. And what I want to do is, is sort of take you through a story which shows you the linkage between climate change and poor air quality. And if we can improve one, we'll get big co-benefits cool of the other, as you've just heard. So whether we're extracting fossil fuels from the earth or processing them, uh, leading to emissions, uh, or using those fossil fuels to generate power or drive our transport systems, we're producing pollution. And those pollutants are both involved in driving climate change, be it CO2, obviously, or PM or NOx emissions from the power and, and transport sectors. So they're very much related. And if we think back 70 years or so, uh, the UK, the main power source, the main fossil fuel we used was coal. And on a typical day in autumn stroke winter in London, this would be what the atmosphere looked like. That's Battersea Power Station there. Uh, or sorry, it's not, it's a Tate, it's what we now call the Tate Modern uh, Power Station on the River Thames. I don't know if any of you were up high, uh, as I was this morning around seven o'clock. And if you looked out across London, it was an absolutely beautiful morning and we had a lovely clear sky. Uh, you never saw that in those days because of the emissions coming, coming from coal as it was our main uh, fossil fuel. So that's, that's a picture of the same location today. And the reason things have changed is we eliminated the use of coal from uh, our, our life. Uh, we had the Clean Air Act that came in in 1956 with, you know, it shut down all these power stations and moved them outside the urban areas, stopped you burning coal in your domestic settings. And we've had a real air quality benefit because of that. But, of course, that's not the case for many places across Europe. This, uh, this cartoon sort of shows you the plans for phasing out coal use in other countries across Europe. And you'll see that in, over in uh, Eastern Europe, then there is a, a much slower uh, removal of coal from their, their system. And in fact, quite often when we have a air pollution episode now in the UK, it's because of those, em those emissions from Eastern Europe being brought in to the UK uh, on, on particular meteorology conditions. So we know that good policies which remove pollutants uh, fossil fuel uh, derived pollutants can improve air quality big time. However, of course, as we remove coal from our system, we brought in an awful lot more road transport. And this led to the, uh, the dramatic increases in the emissions of these tiny particles, we call them PM2.5, and with the, uh, the increase in diesel vehicles in the fleets, then we had a lot more NO2 NOx as well. Uh, and a few years ago, we had some hope that we were actually going to bring in policies which would remove these as well, eventually, from our, our, uh, our environment. Uh, the UK was going to lead the world by banning the, the sale of fossil fuel uh, vehicles, combustion engine vehicles, by 2030. You all know that this has recently been pushed back to 2035. Who knows what will happen uh, if we... Uh, have a change in government next year. Uh, but certainly that was a really progressive policy and would have, in due course, made uh, 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 a lot less uh, pollutants being uh, released into our environment. 
So let's now think about really this high climate change going forward. You've heard all the doom and gloom from Ralph this morning. Uh, it's 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 re it's really not uh, great, is it? And I'm going to add to that now because clearly some of the uh, changes in temperature uh, are are the chemistry of our atmosphere. It's going to have further negative effects on the air we breathe. So I'm going to give you some examples of how that's going to happen. Well, first of all, we're going to have more intense extreme weather events. Uh, they're projected to uh, to increase under future climate change scenarios. One of those is uh, is forest fires uh, and peat fires, and you know we see this regularly now in in the media right across the world. We're seeing a lot more uh, emissions from these from these forest fires, uh, and particularly clearly we we had a lot of problems in southern Europe. Uh, I think we've had major fires in Greece every year for the last five years. But this is a worldwide issue. And clearly, forest fires produce a lot of pollution. And as they become more severe, uh, more intense, then that's only going to increase further. And smoke from these burning fires, uh, it, it, they can ling it lingers. It, it's not as if it disappears. You know, it lingers in the atmosphere. It moves around from, from different region to different regions, traveling often thousands of miles. So when there's a major forest fire in, uh, in Asia, quite often that, those particulates will end up in the west coast of America, for example. So uh, they can have effects you know, on populations living very far away. Climate change also is drying things out. We're seeing more severe droughts. Uh, that's increasing desertification, but it's also just drying out normal farmland, uh, which means that whenever there is some wind that moves across those fields, there will be more entrainment of, of the, the soil particles up into the atmosphere. And for those of you, again, who, who, who look at the, the news coming out of Beijing, China has a, had eno made enormous steps in improving its air quality, coming from the burning of, of coal and from its transport system in the last 10 years. It really, really has made a difference. But now, every year, it's actually suffering this new challenge of very frequent sandstorms coming down from the Gobi Desert. Uh, and, uh, and people are having to go back to wear their masks again uh, because the pollution levels are, are so threatening to their health. Ozone. Ozone's an interesting pollutant. It's not one that you normally talk about, certainly in the UK. So we normally talk about the small particles, PM2.5. We talk about the gas, nitrogen dioxide, both bad for our health. But ozone is even worse. So it's a very, very powerful oxidant. Uh, I think I have a quote coming up. Yeah. So it's really bad for our lungs. And if you think about what we do with ozone from a, a practical point of view, we actually use it to, to clean, to purify our swimming pools. Uh, it, it, it basically kills everything. It's, it's a really, really good killer. So if you breathe in some more ozone, and we're only talking about parts per uh, billion here, if you, if, you, if you breathe in some more ozone, then your lung is going to react to it because it is a powerful oxidant. So why is ozone going to increase? Well, ozone is what we call a secondary pollutant. So it's formed from the action of sunlight, UV radiation, on VOCs, volatile organic compounds. So the more precursors that we're producing in a modern life, the more sunlight we're going to get from uh, increased temperatures, climate change, we're going to generate more ozone. So that is a particular worry, uh, especially for urban areas, which traditionally had lower levels of ozone than, than uh, rural areas because urban areas produced a lot of NO2. So going back to that primary pollutant from coming from traffic, because NO2 reacts with ozone uh, and uh, it's a sacrificial reaction. But as we bring NO2 concentrations down, then we, we end up having uh, the inability to get rid of any ozone which is generated. Social injustice, this is another big issue. We know that, that air pollution often is greatest in areas where 
that, which are socially deprived. Uh, and in particular, those communities, they're not producing a lot of the pollution because most of them don't own cars, for example. But they tend to be actually be in the, the poorer areas where there's a lot of busy roads, etc. So we think that because of the lack of green space and heat island effects with uh, we're going to see increasing with, with climate change, then there's going to be uh, the risks are going to be even distributed uh, more unevenly. So social injustice may increase as a consequence. Biological pollution, pollen. If you suffer an allergy, uh, if you're sensitive to pollen, then you understand this one. Uh, and the fact that because of the change in climate, we know that our the the uh, the this the shrubbery, the trees, etc., that produce pollen, they're going to start producing it earlier because the season is extended, and they're going to be producing it for longer. So there's the, the risk of of more pollen being in the air that we breathe. But it's not only that. We also know that if you take pollen and then you have a changed atmosphere, increased temperature more uh, oxidants within there like ozone, then the pollen itself can become more allergenic. Uh, and that's because the protein coat on the pollen is being oxidized, which changes its, its allergenicity. So that's another risk that we have going forward. And there's, there's, uh, there's data out there showing that things like ragweed pollen uh, is, is predicted to increase uh, across various uh, areas. Uh, across the world. And then finally, I think this is my last slide, climate change and air pollution are bedfellows. So if you address one, you're really addressing the other as well. And that's why it's a win-win situation for the planet if we reduce and eventually eliminate fossil fuel use. Thank you.